This chart shows the domain instructional outcomes breakdown over the review period. This chart allows you to take a look at the number of research articles per domain or instructional area. These feed directly into the evidence-based practice matrix that we will take a look at next. I like the information provided in this chart. It allows me to know that there are 332 uh, research articles that were based in communication. It tells me how much research there was in that area. I know that vocational outcomes, the vocational domain instructional outcome has less at 31. Um, and that's probably due to a lot of different reasons. But I do like the way the breakdown of this information. It tells me that there is a lot of research in the area of challenging and interfering behavior. So 268 articles in included in this review period. This is the evidence-based practice matrix. The one you will find in the report uses abbreviations for the evidence-based practices, which you can see on the left side of the screen and they go kind of down. We have found that it's easier to have those written out in full length. I had some help from one of my coworkers, Sarah Bays, at Kentucky Autism Training Center and she made us this chart which is exactly the same as the chart that you'll find in the report only we have simply written out those evidence-based practices so if you're less familiar with those you're not having to guess what the abbreviations mean. I can use this chart in several ways. Um, I can glance across the top and I see all of the different domain areas academic, adaptive, self-help, behavior, going all the way over to vocational um, I've got my evidence-based practices listed down that left side, and then it's color-coded. So the yellow category is 0 to 5 years old, the blue color is ages 6 to 14 years old, and the green is 15 to 22 years old. We will talk about ways to utilize this chart towards the end of this PowerPoint, um, but I use this very frequently when I was in the classroom. So we'll talk about how I would use that specifically in a few minutes, but I just want you to take a minute, look over the chart, and kind of get a, a chance to see what it looks like. This is one of the most helpful pieces of information out of all of the different parts of that report that I have found. I kept a copy of this evidence-based practice matrix to, to utilize at several different points, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. This chart shows a comparison of evidence-based practices across review periods from 1990 to 2017. It also provides information on why some of the EBPs or evidence-based practices were recategorized over the years. This chart is really helpful information for understanding where some of the manualized interventions fall. And the right side of this chart shows where some of the older categories or domains went. So let me show you how I would use this chart. I can look under augmentative and alternative communication and see that PECS, Picture Exchange Communication System, which in the previous evidence-based practice report was its own category, now I know that it's considered a manualized intervention that falls under the category of augmentative and alternative communication. I can look down to the category of exercise and movement and see that this category was expanded to include mind-body interventions, such things as yoga. If I look on the right side of the screen, I can see where some of the older domains went. So there used to be a domain called um, toilet training, and that has now been moved into antecedent-based interventions. This is probably really helpful information if you're familiar with these from previous years. It helps to make sense of where did that category go? I know that it's still there. Um, I know that it still has a lot of evidence-based practices, but what happened to it and, and why did it get moved? 
each of the evidence-based practices in the report from the National Clearinghouse on Autism and Evidence-Based Practices, or NCAEP, has an intervention fact sheet, which I personally love these. Each fact sheet has a definition of that particular evidence-based practice. It also shows the age range that it is research-based to show the most effectiveness for, and it shows the outcome areas. I would utilize these while deciding what and how to meet or even write students' IEPs. This might be a tool that I could share with my, I, my IEP team members and parents especially to back up why we are including the specific evidence-based practices that we are in students' IEPs. The other nice thing about these intervention fact sheets is, is that they, at the bottom of them, and let me turn on my laser pointer here, kind of here at the bottom of them is a reference chart. Now these go on for several pages on each intervention fact sheet. It'll go on to show every research opportunity, every research paper that was written around all of the different um, factors that they utilize to come up with the evidence-based practices for these. So if augmentative and alternative communication has let's say, I think it was 300 and some um, research opportunities earlier, it's gonna show the references for all of those. So if I wanted to, I could potentially go and look up each of those individual ones if I wanted more specific information on that intervention um, and the resources that were used to come up with why is this evidence-based? What's, what's the evidence show? I could go back and read that individualized evidence instead of just looking at it through this report. So there's one for each of um, the evidence-based practices starting all the way through. They start in the report on around page 67 or 66, I believe is what it is, 66, and they go for a couple of, you know, over 100 pages, I believe. Um, it's a really great resource that I hope you'll take advantage of, and it's something new that was specific to this particular um, reporting period. So great new tool, something that I personally really like. I could print these out. That definition is a great way that I could help teach other people that are working with that student about that evidence-based practice. And I can show, you know what, they are in, um, they're in the third grade. And so this is an elementary age range. And I know that this is a good, this is a good evidence-based practice because this is what the research shows. In this section, we are going to discuss how to choose evidence-based practices and talk about some resources that you can use to do that. Here are four areas to consider. This information comes directly from the AFFIRM modules and I will include this link at the end of the PowerPoint. The first area to consider is child and family characteristics. What are the strengths of the student and what are their interests? What are the family's goals and their input? Maybe they have some specific outcome that they're desiring for their child right now. If it's a younger child, maybe they're hoping they'll learn to write their name. Uh, if it's a transition age or a late high school age student, maybe that student's goal is to live independently. Or maybe there's a family goal, but that, that student will find employment when they leave high school. These are important things to know and to consider when we are looking at what evidence-based practices are appropriate to choose. And the next area is found uh, clues found in the goals or the outcome. So our IEP goals, uh, what are our IEP goals? Uh, those are going to help direct us towards what's the appropriate evidence-based practice. If my goal was employment, I'm a transition age student, I would look at my evidence-based practices chart and I know that for that area, uh, for vocational, for the vocational outcomes area, there's a strong link for high school age students um, with visual supports and video modeling. So I might consider that area uh, as a, an appropriate evidence-based practice. The next area that we'll look at is teacher and team characteristics. I need to think about the skill level of my team. What level of training and support do they need to be successful in implementing the evidence-based practices that we choose? Maybe I know that my team's been together for a long time and they have a high skill set, so I could choose a more challenging evidence-based practice. Or if I knew that this is a new team and there are several 
new team members on this that don't have a high level of training, I know that I need to be careful in what evidence-based practices that I choose so to make sure that we can implement those with fidelity. Another important area to consider is what resources are available in my school, in my classroom, in my district. Um, what's being currently used successfully with the student. So maybe we already are, have evidence-based practices in place for the student, which is awesome. Uh, what's working really well? What did we try that didn't work really well? Um, what equipment do we have in our building, in our school district? If I know uh, I'm going to choose video modeling, I wouldn't want to choose that if I did not have access to an appropriate camera or device or a device that the student could watch it back on. So things to think about. I just need to know that we have the right equipment available for whatever evidence-based practice that I choose or that my district can get and provide that, that equipment if we need it. When choosing evidence-based practices, I need to consider the following. Is this developmentally appropriate for the student? Is this functional or doable for the team and for the student? I want to set my student and my team up for success as much as possible. Does this align with family values? When I'm able to do this, I will have a great plan in place for the student. Let's put it all together. We're going to talk through a couple of examples of how I would use this chart, how I would consider what makes a good choice on an evidence-based practice, but also how I would use this chart to select them. I have a first grade student who is struggling with communication needs and has behavioral concerns. I can look to the communication section across the top. So let me go to that. And I know that he's a first grader. So that means all of this blue right here in the middle is considered a good place to start for, commu for communication. I see that there are many, many options to support communication. I know I'm gonna consider that this student probably needs to start with augmentative and alternative communication because this first grader does not particularly have a good way to communicate their wants and needs. For the behavioral concerns, I'm gonna look at the behavior category across the top. So right in here, once again, it's the blue, which still has a pretty good solid line all the way down across these options for evidence-based practices. I know that this first grader is He's around six years old, so he falls into that lovely blue category. Based on my experiences and my knowledge of the student and conversations with the family, we're going to start with antecedent-based interventions, which is right here on, on the left-hand side. We're going to start with antecedent-based interventions, and we're also going to consider, all the way down here, we're going to consider reinforcement two great places to start when considering communication and behavioral issues for this particular six-year-old. I could add in others. So I could consider visual supports. Um, I might consider social narratives. I'm thinking through the training that my staff has or will need, right? So I'm thinking about what is my staff, what is the skill level of my staff? Have we used antecedent-based intervention? Um, if we use augmentative and alternative communication, what sort of, what are we thinking? What does that look like for this particular student? Um, what training will we need uh, and support so that we can follow through and, and do this right for this, for this student? I'm also thinking about what training might the family need. If I choose augmentative and alternative communication and I'm going to use some sort of device uh, for this student, I want to consider that the family is also going to need to be trained in how to use that because we don't want to just communicate at school. We also want to communicate everywhere that the student goes. So that's one example of how I might use this. And there are many ways uh, that many different ways that you could consider using this particular this particular sheet. And I'll tell you, I kept a copy of it um, laminated <laughs> and was able to pull it out to justify, you know, this is why I'm choosing this. The student is six years old. I know that for behavior and a student based intervention, it's blocked in in the light blue. So it is definitely an evidence based practice that I could consider starting and utilizing for the student.
These are links to the reference material and resources that I used in the making of this PowerPoint, also including additional information on the statistics that I shared. These resources will take you directly links. This one takes you to the Affirm modules. So now you've had an overview of what the evidence-based practices are. And this particular link from Affirm will take you to additional information on all of those or most of those evidence-based practices. This link, this resource, is how to select an evidence-based practices. They have some great information on there, including some charts and checklists that you can utilize while selecting evidence-based practices. So great resources, you should definitely check those out. Here are my references um, in case you are seeking out additional information. And this is my email. Feel free to contact me with any questions that you might have. And I thank you for your time and I hope that this has been helpful. Have a good day.